Around 20 years ago, I was asked to interpret for a speaker. Back then, I was 15. Though I was bilingual, I had never interpreted before. I was freaking out. But my dad, Levon, as usual, pushed me in at the deep end. I had to do it. I had no way around. Back then, I wasn't aware that I was taking my first baby steps towards a great future career. I continued volunteering, using every opportunity to interpret, learn more, improve, and excel. I loved it. I understood that I loved interpreting very much, and I had what it took to be a good one. I wanted to be a great one, the best. My dream was big. During those years, I was pursuing three degrees in music. I had a professional world champion choir. I loved music, I loved conducting, and every time I think of it, my heart still beats fast, very fast. But I knew that music in Armenia wouldn't make money in the long run. So I had to think forward. So I decided to do a degree in teaching English as a foreign language here in AUA. And on top of that, an MBA. My dad was a businessman, ready to support me in any business I wanted to do. He had his own businesses I could run, so business it shall be. MBA here at AUA was great, but the marketplace wasn't. I hated nine to six computer, office, paperwork jobs. It simply killed the creativity in me. I just hated it. What I loved was interpreting. However, the interpreting market seemed impossible to, be, to, be, to enter, regardless of skills, talents, or abilities. It seemed as if I was facing a thick, concrete wall, impossible to drill into. It was hard. And one beautiful day, in the same hall, during one of our regular public events, I had the privilege of listening to one of the best interpreters of Armenia. I mean, he was the most popular interpreter in Armenia. I was so excited to finally see him face to face, talk to him, learn from him, and hopefully take a few classes from him. I was sure I'd be a great student. I was gonna make sure he was super proud of me. This was a dream come true. So during the break, I ran to the hall as fast as I could. Back then I was less than 20, so I was fast, really fast. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I didn't miss my chance to speak with him. I caught him near the reception table. I finally caught my breath, and I said, Hi, I am Naidi Grace Bardakja. I've been interpreting for a few years. I know you are one of the best interpreters in Armenia. I mean, the best. I have so much to learn from you. I am willing to pay anything just to have you as my teacher. Please, even if it is, for a few lessons. My heart was beating as fast as it could. My blood was flushing through my veins at 100 miles per hour. Adrenaline rush all over. I just held my breath, waiting for a reply. This was a dream come true. Please bear in mind that I was speaking with the interpreting guru of Armenia, a top shot, interpreting for presidents of countries. And me, a young girl, a teenager, with limited experience, but a strong drive to excel, to reach the top to become one of the best. I wanted to follow his footsteps. I was ready to do anything he told me to. I was willing to work day and night. Becoming like him was what I was dreaming of back then. So I quickly did the math in my head. Maybe he'll charge $100 a lesson. No, it's a well-paying job. Plus, he's number one. So he'll probably ask for more. But on the other hand, I studied music for 15 years. My teacher was a worldwide famous conductor, Maestro Tigran Hekikan. And he, I did from high school all the way to a PhD with the same professor, and he never charged a single penny. So I thought, well, on second thought, who knows? Maybe free. While I was doing these calculations in my head, trying to solve this probability problem, trying to understand which option had a higher 
chance of occurring. You can tell I teach probability, can't you? So he replied, without a moment of hesitation, I don't train competitors. <laughs> Period. I was lightning struck. Me? A what? Did I hear you say competitor? Speechless, heartbroken. I left. I'll get back to the story later. The doors to my dreams were slammed shut in my face. However, I had to move forward. So I started teaching, teaching English, music, and math. I taught in schools, universities, kindergartens, language centers, taught at home, taught online. I love teaching, and I still do. However, my teaching back then was very different. The logic behind it was the following. I am the teacher, I know better than you, and I am here to teach you. Well, now I know better, and I'll tell you how. Once I had a student who wanted to take math lessons. He wanted to do the SAT. And most of you know that if you teach TOEFL and SAT, you get to work with a lot of teenagers, the cream of the crop. So in most cases, they pop up at my door, refer to me from my former students. We have a quick talk, and we do a quick needs assessment. And this is the time usually when students decide whether they want to work with me or not, and vice versa. To be honest, I rarely refuse to work with a student, but this was the case. This teenage boy seemed to be very lazy, had very basic knowledge in the subject he was planning to study. He wanted to do as little as possible, and on top of that, he seemed to be arrogant and demotivated. So this was tough. But I thought to myself, if I can't handle such a case, then who am I as a teacher? Think forward. You can't always take the shortest and easiest route when things get tough now, can you? Deep down in my heart, I knew I had to do something. I had to find a way around. It wasn't easy. I tried various methods. I tried being a friend, <coughs> being a strict teacher, tried offering free lessons if homework was done fully, tried allowing him to go a bit early if classwork was done efficiently, tried showing interest in his hobbies, which was playing video games. By the way, did you know that if you are good at playing video games, you can earn millions? Mm -hmm. There are online worldwide video game championships. There are rankings of players. There are people who donate money just to have a comment before under your game. All these things I learned from my students. At times, it did seem impossible. It did take the additional efforts to go the extra mile. But believe it or not, it worked. Now this young man is much more to me than just a student. He has become a very dear person to my heart. And by the way, he's in the hall. <laughs> Lesson learned. Do not be quick to judge. You never know. The prickles on the inside are usually much smaller than those on the outside. Be patient while you are navigating through storms of difficult characters, annoying habits, and the like. This guy taught me more than I did to him. He taught me that not everything you see is what you see. He taught me to give a second thought when I am dead sure I am right. Well, is it a six or a nine? It depends on the angle you're looking at it from. Is it an H or an N? It depends on the language you're coming from. Now when I look back at the naughtiest of my students, the students who constantly wanted to break the rules, those who were labeled troublemakers, rebels, and the like, the students who were struggling with their studies, those who didn't care for their studies, I want to apologize from the depths of my heart for having used these labels, though never to your face, but deep down in my heart. The labels I should have used was diamonds in the rough. Diamonds that have taught me to be patient and wait for the flowers of the cacti to bloom and not be distracted by the prickles. Diamonds that have shaped me as a teacher, a friend, and a mother of three sons. 
diamonds in the rough. Having moved to Armenia from California while I was at school was a shock. I was definitely not a diamond, but I was in the rough. I was labeled as the odd one out, the newcomer, this and that. I was under the red pen curse, constantly being corrected rather than being thought. I was constantly being labeled out rather than being helped out. I was left out because I enjoyed going to church. I felt stupid because I just didn't get the hang of math. The only time I was a star was during English lessons, and you can tell why. For years on my math notebook, I would write vampires class. Instead of writing math class, I just hated it. And however, as I precise these quotes, this too shall pass. And it did. With the help of my mom, Silva, I was blessed with a teacher who was next to me and not above me. And that's all it took to fly. Got straight A's all the way through. A good lesson learned. Not everything you see is what you see from the last to the first. Now when I teach, I treat each one of my students with a question mark in my hand, in my head. Interesting what she will become. Curious to see him after five to ten years, I'm sure he's going to make it. Think forward. You might be shaping the character of a future president. True, you may also be training a competitor. A competitor or a team player, it all depends on you. Just like in football, soccer, the players on the opposing side, whom you consider your rivals, may one day, one day be on the same team as you are. Ironic, isn't it? Anyhow, on my way up as an interpreter, I did face a myriad of obstacles and hostility. But my story didn't end there. So where was I? Yes, he replied, I don't train competitors, period. I was rejected once again. Not good enough, once again. The best teacher let me down. Shocked at what I was faced with, Heartbroken, my dreams were going down the drain. Confused, trying to understand how on earth could I ever be a competitor to this big shot. However, I had to move on. I continued interpreting, took all the available courses, read all the possible books, continued interpreting, did it again and again and again and again for 18 years. And one beautiful day, it hit me. He was right. He was right. The obstacles I faced, the unwelcoming doormat, the fierce competition, all together became the perfect jumping board for me to become what I was told I would be, a competitor. Now, having climbed many mountains, having made all the possible mistakes, I train young interpreters, help them build their own network, help them move forward, and after that, I push them off the cliff. Let me tell you what I mean. A short story. The teacher said, come to the edge. The students replied, it's too high. The teacher said, come to the edge. The students replied, we might fall. The teacher demanded, come to the edge, and they did and she pushed them, and they flew. Very often, a slight push is what is necessary to make them fly. I dream of seeing my students become better than I am, become the best that they can be, and they will. And when they do, I will have competitors. Competitors on the same team. A team who support one another, who work with one another. A team who lift each other up and back up one another. A team that does not limit your opportunities, but on the contrary, the team that opens doors for future opportunities. If you think forward, you will not only be shaping the future of others, but your own as well. The people we invest in now will be the harvest we reap 
in the future. Back then, I wish I were considered a team member and not a competitor. However, I do understand why he said, I do not train competitors. He was right from a business point of view. Armenia, indeed, is a very small market. And at least he was honest about it. However, with all due respect, my calling is another. I believe that what goes around comes around. Therefore, I sow seeds of encouragement and support on my way back up, because when I come back down, I will be reaping the results. Therefore, let's do unto others as we would like them do unto us. The obstacle you are considering as fierce competition now may in fact be your future cooperation. Remember, not everything you see is what you see. Therefore, let's go after the diamonds in the rough.